moving as quickly as we can through radiation pretty much covering a whole trimester in a single lecture um, we're going to talk about radiosensitivity these are all big big terms here radiosensitivity all that pours into that term somatic effects soma the Greek word for the body so somatic effects are how it impacts the body we'll look in particular at acute radiation syndromes and then we're going to talk about Embryolog embryonic and fetal risks, as well as genetic impact. So sometimes the embryonic stuff is called tetragenic um, it, to differentiate it from genetic stuff. Genetic stuff is stuff that would be inherited from one generation to another, like the little three-eyed fish on The Simpsons, if it has other little three-eyed fish babies, right? Um, okay. So anytime you see a blue screen on this presentation, it's when I'm introducing another one of those big, big concepts. So the very first big concept we're going to talk about is radiosensitivity. It's a big, big concept. Um, the ways that I'm going to break this down is we'll talk about dose-response relationships, relative tissue radiosensitivities, and that has to do with linear energy transfer and RBE, which is radiologic or relative biologic effect. Um, then we'll look at cell survival and recovery, so the LD50 system of looking at cell survival. Um, and then we'll talk about oxygen and its impact on radiation sensitivity. Typically when I think about radiosensitivity, I think about it, um, I break it down mentally into, into the three big sciences that pour into it. They are biology, chemistry, and physics. So what you all have covered a lot of so far up to this point in your study is the physics part of it, these particle interactions, um, the ways that photons ionize things and, and situations like that. Just understand that when we're talking about the cells of the body and how radiation dose impacts the cells of the body, there's a biological aspect of that, which is things like cell and cellular reproduction, and then there's chemistry within those cells as well, both organic and inorganic chemistry. So when we're thinking about something like dose, one of the ways that we might consider that is that it's a mathematical relationship between various radiation dose levels and the magnitude of observable biological response. Okay? These dose-response relationships um, are broadly classed in these three different ways. And you can think about each one of these as being a spectrum. There's early to late spectrum stuff, high dose to low dose spectrum stuff, and the deterministic to stochastic spectrum stuff. And we're going to unpack what each one of those terms means. Um, but a lot of times students get confused on this point um, that these we're talking about three different spectrums here. Um, so I want to make sure that we're clear that we can... We can have, for example, early high-dose stochastic or deterministic effects, right? We can, we can start to combine these spectrums together in order to more accurately describe what's occurring. So, deterministic. The way that I remember this is it is determined by the dose. So the prime example that we will see occupationally is skin burns. And the primary place that we see it is like cardiac cath or any time we're using high dose rate fluoro. We, may, we have the potential to cause skin burns to the patient's body in the area that we're fluoroing. And it will look just like a sunburn, right? Um, the amount of the, how much the skin burns is directly determined by how much radiation that person receives. Now, one of the weird things about these sunburns that patients receive is it has nothing to do with how likely they are to get a sunburn <laughs> normally. Like, y'all know me. I'm a very pale and pasty guy. Both sides of my family are Scottish, and what I inherited from my parents and grandparents was male pattern baldness and alcoholism and pale, pasty skin, right? And I sunburn really easy. Now, the weird thing about this stuff is I might not necessarily radiation burn easy. And I've seen African-American women who do. So it's weird, right? There's a weird part to it, but it is similar to getting a sunburn. 
But again, the point of this slide is that it is determined by the dose. Versus stochastic, this is the other side of the spectrum. This is a fancy word for random, right? So one way to think about it is if I gave you a quarter every time I punched you in the arm, right? Every time I punch you in the arm, I gave you a quarter. How sore your arm gets is directly related to, determined by how many quarters you now have, right? That would be a deterministic response. Um, we could track the amount of soreness in the arm to how many quarters a person has. Now if I say instead, every time I punch you in the arm, I'm going to flip a quarter, and that's going to determine how sore your arm gets, right? So I'm going to flip a quarter, punch you in the arm if it's heads, not punch you in the arms if it's tails, right? That is a stochastic effect. It's a random in nature. Every time a person's exposed to radiation in this way, there's a coin toss that occurs. And it can or cannot relate to a response. These are things like cancer, primarily, um, uh, nonspecific lifespan shortening, and some genetic effects. Um, there's a really bad mnemonic here that uh, a gene cancer kicked it low and late. Um, genetic and cancer effects are generally related to low radiation dose, and they are late effects. So they are stochastic in nature, but those other two spectrums means that these are low radiation dose exposures, and they are a late, not an early, but a late-term radiation response. Okay, Really bad mnemonic, but in general, stochastic effects are going to be related to low doses of radiation in late responses. So one of the ways that we want to think about this is start to model how these different radiation dose responses look when we put them on a graph. And the three, uh, the two big models that we are interested in are linear non-threshold types and non-linear threshold types. So this part right here is talking about linear, and they have a non-threshold, which means that there's not a point at which um, we have to exceed. Just as soon as you start irradiating someone, they, um, th there's a potential increase in this response. So these linear non-threshold type dose responses are things, again, like cancer, leukemia, and genetic effects. This is the most conservative model and we will look at it here in just a minute. This is a linear non-threshold model uh, is exampled here with B and A. Um, so we have a radiation dose down here along the x-axis and a radiation response along the y-axis. As the dose increases, we see responses increasing as well. Right. So as a person is exposed to radiation, there's no safe amount of radiation. We just see a potential increase in cancer incidence over populations. That's what B is modeling. This one right here, model A, is sometimes used to represent things like mental retardation. There's already a naturally occurring amount of intellectual disabilities in any given population. Um, when we introduce radiation into that population, we see that incidence increase from that already present amount of intellectual disability. So again, no threshold. Just as soon as the person is irradiated, we start to see the potential for a response. And so this is again related to those stochastic effects of radiation, things like cancer. By contrast over here, line C and line D both have a threshold. You can see D sub T means there's a dose threshold. We hit a point, so the person's been irradiated, 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 bam. And when we cross this threshold, that's when we start to see the response. Example of that might be cataracts, right? 
nonlinear dose responses are curves. So they vary non-proportionally, right? Um, generally, what we deal with are nonlinear threshold dose responses. So that final one, and I'll show you what that looks like here. It is curve C in this illustration. This is generally how we model the deterministic radiation dose responses, the ones that are determined by the dose. So the person is irradiated, irradiated, bam, they hit this threshold here, and we start to see the response. And the response, the, de the severity of the response is determined by the dose. And my, you might wonder why there is this shoulder here, right? There's a point at which if you can imagine this, we're burning someone with this fluoro machine. There's a point at which there's nothing left to burn, right? And so at that point, we start to see a fall off of the response because we have hit a point of what we would call overkill. Our one thing that's fortunate for us all is diagnostic radiology is concerned almost exclusively with the late effects of radiation exposure and therefore linear non-threshold dose response relationships. The good news about that is that we are going to follow the most conservative model of radiation dose response for our work. Okay, so we've talked some about doses and these responses that we're going to look at. Now we need to talk about the tissue itself. And in 1906, Burgundy and Tribondeau and one other researcher in France did the first, some of the first research into radiosensitivity as it relates to different cell types. So the different cells in the body have different radiation dose responses. Um, one of the things that they found is that stem cells are more radio, uh, radiosensitive than mature cells, so mature cells are more radioresistant. Younger tissues and organs are radiosensitive, so we talk about how embryos, fetuses, young children are more radiosensitive than adults, and some of that has to do with just sheer size of their body as well as um, how young the tissue is. Tissues with high metabolic activity are radiosensitive, and so this discovery led to the development of radiation oncology because the most rapidly dividing cell in the human body is probably a cancer cell. So it's highly, highly, it's very typically a very simple kind of cell, um, and it's also highly metabolic. Um, so this high proliferation rate for cells and a high growth rate for tissues result in increased radiosensitivity. That is the law of Burgundy and Tribondeau. Both parts need to be present in order to be expressing that law, both high metabolic rate um, and high proliferation or uh, um, well, immature cells are more radiosensitive. So here is it graphically displayed here from a range from resistant to sensitive. And so over here on the resistant side, we have muscles, nerves, and the brain on the organ level. Um, as we move to slightly uh, more resistant, we have things like the liver, mature bone cells. When we get to the more sensitive side, we've got the skin and the lens of the eyes, and the most sensitive cells in the body are things like bone marrow, red, uh, the stem cells that form uh, blood cells, lymphocytes, um, and immature sex cells. So that would be like the uh, spermatogonia, not the sperm, right? They go through their own weird uh, development cycle. Um, Probably the most radiosensitive cell in the body, though, from everything that I've read, is the T lymphocytes. We also have to consider how the radiation it, it itself um, affects the tissues, and so we need to consider different types of radiation, and that's a very specific term. When I talk about radiation type, I mean is it particulate? Is it photon? What type of particle? Those kinds of things. Because each type of radiation has its own amount of, radi of energy that it distributes as it passes through biological tissue. X-rays distribute very little energy. They pass straight through the body. Gamma rays and X-rays both pass straight through the body 
and don't ionize a whole lot of stuff. Things like alpha particles, though, they're heavy particles. They're basically helium nuclides, meaning they're um, like a helium atom without the electrons. They pass through the body like a bowling ball, and they're going to get stopped that much sooner, right? So they're going to give off all their energy in a single set of impacts that are very, very detrimental to the body. So they have a higher amount of linear energy transfer. We can express it in all these goofy ways. Um, you don't necessarily need to remember that the diagnostic let of x-rays is 3 kilo electron volts per micron, but this is nerdy stuff that helps us uh, quantify what it is we're talking about. These are very specific measures. Okay. Another thing that influences this and is a way that we continue to model this is an LD50. Um, we can make LD50s for exposures to all sorts of things. So when you pump gas, guess what? Pumping gas is related to incidents of genetic mutation and cancer and uh, mental retardation, all of those things. We don't think about that when we pump gas, but guess what? Inhaling gasoline fumes has an LD5030. If you sit around and inhale enough gasoline fumes, 50% of the population will be dead in 30 days, right? That's what that term means. It means a lethal dose for 50% of the population. And generally, it's given over an amount of time. So the LD5030 is a whole body dose of radiation that can be lethal to 50% of the exposed population within 30 days. But we use, again, we use that to quantify risk for all sorts of exposures. So this is a quantitative measure. It's fairly imprecise. We extrapolate this data from experiments on <laughs> animals. Right? We don't go out and irradiate populations and then see how many of them lived. Um, one of the things that we are interested in, and it's where we are fairly complex uh, life forms here on this planet, is we are interested in how different cell populations have their own LD5030s. So going back to that law of Burgundy and Tribondeau, different cell populations within your body have different LD5030s. Okay? So they contribute to the health of the whole. For humans, <clears throat> the LD5030 uh, for adults is generally 3 to 4 gray. That's a very high amount of radiation exposure. Nothing that you will ever be getting in a single day in diagnostic imaging. That would need to be given at a single acute instant. So here is that mapped onto that linear, uh, or that nonlinear threshold response curve, and so there's the curve again, and we see that there's a threshold around one gray, and at that threshold we have a, a mild toe region where uh, the response is not that uh, significant, only a portion of the population is dying off, but when we get up to about three, somewhere between three and four gray, we have 50% of the population dead within a month, three to four gray. So how do we um, think about that in terms of world health and things like that? One thing that we should understand about the human body is it has a remarkable ability to repair. Each cell does. In fact, the DNA, if it, the DNA is disrupted, which we would consider the target of radiation damage, is, would be disrupting the DNA. The DNA has the ability to repair itself. So repair processes can be initiated which is part of what we're exploiting as x-ray workers, people working around radiation, is we work a certain period of time and then we take time off. No one needs to work in x-ray or in fluoro on, for a 24-hour shift, not just for their mental health, but for the health of their cells. Because during that rest period when we're sleeping or when we're eating or not working around the radiation, guess what? Our body's initiating repair mechanisms. Um, so there's repair enzymes that help uh, repair and recover uh, any sublethal doses of ionizing radiation. And after your radiation, surviving cells begin to repopulate. So even if we wipe out the stem cell population, they begin to repopulate. Finally, there is an oxygen enhancement ratio. And basically this means that hypox uh, hypoxic areas or areas of low oxygen are less radiosensitive sensitive. 
than areas that are oxygenated. So well oxygenated areas are more radiosensitive. Um, this uh, is sometimes called the oxygen effect. It's largely academic in nature. It's something that you need to know. I believe it's in your key terms. Um, if you were to ask my opinion, like where does it relate most, is probably to things like space travel. Because the other people who are interested in this beyond us is NASA, right? Because they're trying to send people to Mars. And guess what outer space is full of? Radiation, right? So they need to understand if we... If there's a way that we reduce oxygen in the space shuttle or whatever, are we going to reduce radiation dose responses? Okay, big blue screen here, which means we're shifting gears to another big, big concept, okay? We've touched on all the aspects that influence radio sensitivity. We, we talked about how there's different ways that we can model it, there's both deterministic and stochastic effects, so there's things that are determined by the dose as well as random events that it increase in likelihood as dose increases. Um, and then we unpacked how different radiation types influence the body. Now let's talk about the body itself and these somatic effects. Somatic effects, again, just refer to the cells of the body. So depending upon the time from the moment of irradiation to the first appearance of symptoms, we are going to classify these as early or late somatic effects. Early effects. Generally, these are deterministic in nature. If you think about it, we said that stochastic was primarily cancer. The stuff you can't get cancer overnight is what I'm saying. But what you can get is a skin burn overnight, right? So these deterministic, they were used to be called non-stochastic, but basically deterministic because they're determined by the dose. The consequences largely can be attributed to cell death, and they are directly related to the dose received, so they increase. Generally, these doses have a threshold, and once we hit that threshold, that's when we start to see the dose response. And the amount of biological damage depends on the actual absorbed dose of ionizing radiation. So there's going to be significant differences between a radiation dose from a particulate source of radiation versus something like a gamma ray or a, a photon from an x-ray machine. So here again is that threshold nonlinear dose response model. So early deterministic somatic effects are going to appear within minutes, hours, days, or weeks. They require a substantial dose of ionizing radiation, like one gray or higher. Um, and diagnostic imaging in general does not produce a radiation dose uh, of that magnitude. The one exception we've mentioned already is high dose rate fluoroscopy. Here are what we would expect to see. Some of the high dose effects would include nausea, fatigue, erythema, which means skin reddening or the skin burns again, epilation, which is loss of hair, blood disorders like anemia, intestinal disorders like uh, denuding of the uh, gastrointestinal tract, which leads to diarrhea and uh, electrolyte imbalances, and those are the things that actually kill you. Um, fever, moist and dry disquamination, which means the skin starts to slough off and it looks kind of slick or moist on the outside, um, as well as depressed sperm and infertility for both males and females. That would be at a dose of higher than 6 gray to the genitals. So um, don't ask me how we know all this stuff. We'll get into it when we go into radiation biology. Just understand that this is not from experiments that were done recently. Some of this data, frankly, comes from Nazi experiments. So there's a lot of ethical dilemmas about how even we know this material, right? Here's an example of an early deterministic somatic effect from an early responder to the Chernobyl uh, power plant disaster that happened in April of 18, 1986. This man was a fire worker who was working there to contain the fire and the radioactive materials that were burning there at the power plant, and he received this radiation skin burn to his arm. So I'm going to make another big shift here, and we're going to talk about acute radiation syndromes. These are sometimes called radiation sickness. I typically refer to them as ARS.
So acute meaning they're going to happen quickly. Radiation and syndrome meaning that there's going to be different kind of compartments or silos of responses that we see de determined again by the dose. These are for whole body doses of ionizing radiation delivered over a short period of time, like in a day or less. And the data that we have on this comes from epidemiologic studies of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, Marshall Islanders who survived nuclear fallout from U.S. tests, as well as nuclear people who, who were first responders to Chernobyl, and honestly patients who have undergone radiation therapy. So there are three large um, types of acute radiation syndrome. There's the hemopoietic syndrome, and this is or sometimes called bone marrow syndrome. This is doses from 1 to 10 gray in tissue, so that should be gray sub T. It just didn't transfer over appropriately. Um, the damage that the body receives is largely to the immature blood cells, and so we see decreased red blood cell counts, uh, destruction of bone marrow, and destruction of T-cell lymphocytes and the white blood cells, so the body has a reduced amount of, uh, it's immunocompromised, in other words, um, and that generally the a death related to this is from either the anemia um, or that immunocompromised state. Okay. Um, once we hit to a threshold of about 6 gray, so 6 to 10 gray and a little bit higher, we have GI syndrome. Um, this is where um, intestinal denuding occurs. And so um, next kind of up our chart of radiosensitive cells is the lining of the intestines. We kill the immature lining cells of the intestines. The mature cells continue to grow and function, but then when that population of cells dies up off, there's not a backing population to meet the intestines' needs. And so we call this intestinal denuding. Um, if you can imagine, it's almost like having a sunburn throughout your digestive system and you lose fluids rapidly, um, and that results in what we call electrolyte imbalance, which ultimately is fatal. The final and most uh, acute of all the syndromes is the CNS, or uh, central nervous system syndrome, um, sometimes called the cerebrovascular syndrome. This is doses in excess of 50 gray. Um, in this syndrome, there is no hematologic syndrome. There is no GI syndrome because the person is not alive long enough to experience those syndromes. They die within five or six days. The longest living person was a, a double agent that was poisoned with polonium um, in Great Britain. We'll talk more about him. He lived about six days and died of a heart attack. So essentially what had happened was the radiation dose was significant enough to destroy nerve cells, which we said are the most radiosensitive, radio-resistant cells in the body, and that destruction of the nerve cells caused the brain to no longer be functioning. So the confusion, fever, and then ultimately he died of just his heart stopped beating. His brain stopped telling his heart to beat. That was a very, very significant dose of radiation. So here's an, acute, here's an overview of these acute radiation lethalities, and it more or less just tracks with everything I just told you. This is kind of scary stuff. One thing to pull out of this is that there's different stages of this, these syndromes, and that's one of the reasons why we, we call them syndromes. There's a prodromal, latent, and then manifest illness uh, period. So you can see prodromal means those very first things we see, generally nausea, vomiting. If it's a significant enough dose, maybe confusion. There's a latent period um, in doses in that range that varies depending on the dose. So the latent period may be a matter of days. It may be a matter of weeks where no sickness is evident. The person appears to be normal. They can return to normal activity periods then we hit the manifest illness, and that's where we have the uh, different uh, responses here. So one way to remember that is prodromal, latent, manifest, 
I think about it, please let me die or recover, right? Um, that, is the, that is the staging of these syndromes. So here it again is uh, that please let me die or recover um, illustrated um, graphically. We see uh, an increase of uh, symptoms here in that prodromal period, a latent period where the patient seems to return to normal, there's no dose response, then the actual manifest illness. This shoulder here represents either that period of overkill where the patient is not able to, um, the body's not able to repair, or a, a period of repair. Um, in general, if there is repair, it need, there will need to be things like bone marrow transplants and stuff like that um, in order to cause repopulation of, of the red blood cells in uh, lymphocytes. So here again is uh, just revisiting this LD5030 concept. Um, it is largely from epidemiologic data um, with large populations who have been exposed to doses of radiation in excess of one gray. It looks like some of the I apologize. Okay. Um, in the event that a person has been able to compensate for this exposure uh, to a, a acute and significant amount of radiation, um, they will, even if they're able to repair and recover, experience some atrophy of the organs and tissues. Um, we see this quite frequently with radiation therapy patients um, where we have irradiated the area, um, but there will be some atrophy or of function in that area. So it may, we are going to give, we're going to fractionate the dose and give them time to repair. Um, but even with that time to repair, um, there will be some atrophy. Uh, sometimes uh, the organ can, can come back. Um, but the consequences is basically organs and tissues um, may lose their ability to function or they may recover almost fully. Here's an example of uh, radiodermatitis um, or cancerous lesions. This is a, a woman who survived, uh, uh, I think it was the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The skin burns that we see is the kimono was actually burned into her skin. Um, and so we have ample evidence to suggest that radiation causes uh, this, this kind of burning uh, thing. And we call it radiodermatitis to differentiate from other uh, skin disorders um, because along with the organ atrophy, um, if the capillaries within the skin are destroyed as well, we may have necrosis that sets in due to loss of blood flow to that area. Here is just kind of a little bit more on radiation ionizing effects on the skin. This would be, again, the only, pretty much the only uh, acute radiation type uh, deterministic effect that we would expect to see as x-ray technologists. And so there's even been suggested that there should be something like a skin syndrome um, because it does follow some of the patterns that we see with the other syndromes where there's uh, a prodromal period, a latent period, and then manifest illness. Um, so uh, that's also true with epilation or loss of hair from radiation exposure. Um, so moderate radiation doses will cause uh, temporary hair loss. Uh, if it's a large dose of radiation, it will result in permanent hair loss. Um, and uh, there's some examples that we have. At one point in time, we were using uh, Grin's rays to treat things like ringworm. So we were trying to kill worms. Um, within people's bodies with a something like an ortho voltage, which means somewhere between uh, x-ray energy and uh, what's now therapeutic ranges of energy x-rays. Um, and uh, we saw epilation and skin burns that resulted from those treatments. These hematologic effects, again, um, the... <clears throat> 1920s and 1930s were the only period where they were actually using people's blood count to determine whether they had been around x-rays too much. So I'm saying that they actually tracked people's red blood cell counts 
at this period x-ray workers to determine if they had received too much x-rays. We don't do that anymore, um, but it does uh, reduce um, uh, blood counts. So even things like research that I've seen recently, um, CT scans actually reduce red blood cell counts and definitely impact T-cell lymphocyte, lymphocyte populations. Um, it's also something that we have to track during radiation therapy. Um, in general, this is not impactful to diagnostic energy, uh, diagnostic X-ray. Again, the one the one exception to that is is fluoroscopy. So if we have a patient who's received skin burns from a fluoro exam, they also need to start tracking their red blood cell counts. When we think about why that's the case. Um, and how these hematologic effects occur, we have to go back to that uh, law of Burgundy and Tribendeau, where it is the um, immature and highly proliferating cells that are the most radiosensitive. And so what happens is, uh, after the initial radiation exposure, um, the mature blood cells may be okay, but the stem cells are not. Um, they've been impacted. Uh, but Frankly, the erythrocytes and the lymphocytes are so radiosensitive that they, they probably would be impacted as well. What we do know is that whole body doses as low as 0.25 gray in tissue um, can produce measurable hematologic depression, um, and that is within the range of diagnostic energies. Um, okay, effects on the reproductive system. Um, <coughs> gonadal doses of radiation can cause two possible different things to happen, and this is why the gonads are so significant. Um, on the one side, it may depress um, populations of things like sperm, right? So uh, the sex cells themselves. On the other side, it could pass on genetic mutation to the next generation. So those are two different things. One of them is a somatic effect. It's affecting a cell of the body, a sperm cell, right? The other thing is a genetic effect. It's affecting future populations, right? Um, and then gonadal doses can also delay or suppress menstruation for females. Why that's the case, we don't yet fully understand. But the exact same thing would be of concern, and it's the reason why um, females are of greater risk, right? Because females are carrying all the egg cells, both mature and immature, within their body, right? If a guy is irradiated, what, two, three weeks later, all those sperm cells have cleared off, and there's a new population that was not irradiated. For the female patient, those immature, amateur ovum are still present in the body. And so they have that risk of, of, of a genetic mutation, passing on a genetic mutation. So I've included this illustration here in order to just differentiate one very special thing. This over here, this guy and this gal are immature. They are more radiosensitive, right? So they are like these stem cells. They're pluripotent, um, and they are more radiosensitive when that cell is in that form. Once it gets over here to the ovum and the sperm, these are both mature, highly specialized cells, so they are more radioresistant. So even within this cell population, there's a spectrum of radiosensitivity. Does that make sense? But like we mentioned, with the male patients, these guys go through their lifespan about every two to three weeks, and they're gone, right? For the ladies, these people hang around. So that's the, that's the concern, is that genetic risk to future, future generations. Okay, let's talk about the late radiation effects. There's two types, late deterministic, somatic effects, so effects to the body, and then late stochastic effects. 
Um, and these are from radiation, generally low doses of radiation delivered over long intervals of time. This is us, right? This is us telling patients to hold their breath with the door open or something stupid like that and receiving that low dose of every day, I get a little bit of radiation. Honestly, it's also people living in Denver, Colorado. They have a natural background radiation exposure that's much higher than ours due to both their elevation and um, terrestrial radiation like the mountains. So the major types of late effects are carcinogenesis, which is stochastic in nature. It's random in nature, to the best of our understanding. Cataractogenesis, or the development of cataracts, which is deterministic. Even though it's a long-term thing, every day, day in, day out, if we're working on the fluoro machine and not wearing our lead glasses, day in, day out, um, that long, low um, radiation exposure is going to hit a threshold and we're going to start to see a spike in the potential for cataract formation. Basically, think about it like this. Cataracts are um, a breaking of the lens in the eye, right? That's basically what they are, just an occlusion of the lens. It's, think about it like you're throwing rocks at a window. You, if, even if they're little tiny rocks, you throw enough rocks at that window, eventually the, the window is going to start to crack. And you're going to start to see um, that effect of all the little tiny rocks hitting the window. And then these embryologic or tetralogic effects, these include things like birth defects, and they are stochastic in nature, right? Um, so these are, um, the, the, all three of these are of concern to us as um, x-ray uh, imagers. So let's talk about what the risks are. What we know is that exposure to ionizing radiation may cause cancer as a late stochastic effect. And I always think about the uh, OR nurses who every time I came in with my C-arm and passed out lead aprons, they would say, well, I'm done having babies. And I would also say, well, are you done being cancer-free as well? Because the concern is not just whether or not we're irradiating ovaries, it's also the potential risk for cancer. At high doses, the risk is measurable in exposed human populations. We do not have data on the low doses. We just don't. Um, and we'll talk more about why that is next year, but just know for right now, what we know is that at relatively high doses, we see an increased risk for cancer. Um, at low doses, below, below 0.1 sievert, which includes us, um, the, risk, the risk is not directly measurable. So the risk um, is overshadowed by other causes of cancer in humans, like, again, pumping our own gasoline. So let's talk a little bit about carcinogenesis. It is the most important late stochastic effect caused by exposure to ionizing radiation. If I was going to write a test question about this material, that would be one, right? What is the most important late stochastic effect or late effect of radiation exposure? <clears throat> it's random in occurrence. Difficulties that we have is a lot of this data comes from looking at experiments with animals, which don't always map directly onto human populations. Also, within human populations, it may take five or more years for the cancer incidence to occur. So it's going to take time before we actually see the manifest illness. Um, the physical appearance of cancer caused by ionizing radiation is not, doesn't look any different from any other, from the normal appearance of that cancer. So cancer is cancer is what this is saying. Um, <clears throat> and then cancer caused by low-level radiation is very difficult to identify. So again, there's problems with this data. Here are examples, though, that we have of populations of people that were exposed to high amounts of radiation historically and who had an increased incidence of different types of cancer. One of the more famous and widely published ones is the radium watch style painters who in the 20s and 30s were working at factories, uh, largely women. They were painting the watch dials of things like with a radioactive uh, uh, element. And uh, that, caused the, uh, that caused the watch dial to glow. In fact, if you have a watch that glows in the dark, 
guess what? That's a radioactive element that allows it to do that, right? They were using radium at that time. They were also painting things like gun sights because during World War I, when there was a lot of nighttime combat, they needed to be able to see things like their watch dials and their gun sights and stuff like that. Long story short, they were ingesting the radium because every time they painted the watch dial, they licked the paintbrush to get a tip, right? And every time they licked that paintbrush, they were ingesting radium. Anything that ends with an um, any element that ends with an um, your body thinks is calcium, right? So radium, calcium, thorium, um, barium, all of that stuff your body is going to pick up and try to place in the bones as a way to reinforce um, the calcium deposits that are in the bone. And the area where calcium is most needed in the body is in the jaw. We use our jaw the most, and we're constantly building up our teeth. So these women, literally their jaws fell off. It was a huge epidemic, and it was very clear that it was related to their employment. Some of the postmortems that they did on these women, they were highly radioactive, right? Um, uranium miners, largely Navajo people in Arizona and New Mexico, inhaled uranium dust into their lungs, and we saw an increase in lung cancer. Early medical radiation workers, we saw increase in cancers, um, solid tumors in those populations, um, and on down through the atomic bomb survival survivors in Chernobyl. The largest public health impact of Chernobyl has been an increase in thyroid cancer, and that's thought because the iodine-131 went into the atmosphere, got picked up by clouds, rained down into the grass, the cows ate the grass, so now the milk is radioactive milk, and we're drinking it. And so where does it go by that's radiosensitive as we're drinking it? Our thyroid. So the thyroid was the primary uh, cancer uh, caused by Chernobyl. We've seen upwards of probably about 13,000 additional cases of thyroid cancer because Chernobyl. And that's not just within like the Soviet bloc. Chernobyl affected the entire north hemisphere of this planet. It blew stuff high enough and there was enough of this stuff that it affected cornfields in Iowa. Like cereal got recalled in America because of Chernobyl. So it was a big... Here is what uh, carcinoma of the distal arm, probably one of the first uh, documented photographs of cancer caused by radiation exposure to a radiation worker. We do see... Um, one of the other things that we've looked at is the population of leukemia increase in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is a huge study. It is ongoing. Um, related, in a related study, there's actually a study, you can look it up online, of 250,000 x-ray technicians who were employed in the United States um, at or before the year 1980-something, 1983. Um, and it looked at what was their cancer risks? And that's an ongoing study. It's the largest study of its type. Um, so it, that data is out there. Um, honestly, it's a lot to wade through. And the big takeaway is maybe cancer's gone up a little bit. Maybe it has. It's, it hasn't. Who knows? But here is um, what we saw. Uh, and we saw a spike in leukemia. But interestingly enough, the leukemia incident fell below um, the normal population after a period of some time. And so this uh, data here um, actually wound up becoming highly controversial. We'll talk more about it later on. Okay, there is a high probability, and this would be a number to remember, two gray. There's a high probability that a single dose of approximately 2 gray will induce the formation of cataracts. You are not going to get 2 gray of radiation in a single day. But if you're working in fluoroscopy, what they're also finding is that that repeated exposure of high doses of, of x-rays could eventually hit a threshold, and you are now a good candidate for cataracts. Um, so this, the results of this uh, disorder are complete or uh, partial loss of vision, and uh, we have seen this in uh, 
uh, human populations as well as an animal population. Here's just an example of how that occlusion can happen. And you can see there's just a cloud here um, in the lens of the eyes like that window that we've been pelting with rock. Okay, finally, the embryologic effects, birth defects. They need to be mapped onto the stages of human development because just like what we are talking about with the different cells, the early, early parts of the embryo are much more radiosensitive than the uh, mature fetus. The mature fetus is a very radio-resistant little bugger. But that early um, period uh, of pre-implantation is by far the most radiosensitive, and this is a do-or-die phase. If a person's irradiated pre-implantation, that's zero to nine days post-conception, then it either, it's an all-or-nothing kind of thing at that point. Either the ovum will be able to implant to the wall of the uterus, or it won't. Um, so at that period of about two weeks, um, we are not necessarily concerned with irradiation exposure. In fact, that is the period in which we want to do things like CT scans on females. We will ask them questions like, when was your last menstrual period? And as long as we're within two weeks of that last menstrual period, we are safe to do the CT scan. Why? Because it's an all-or-nothing kind of thing. I know that's kind of weird science to be thinking about, but what we're saying is if the ovum is irradiated at this point, either it's going to die or it's not, right? And we're okay with that. Like, that is preferable to what comes later. So what comes later? This period of major organogenesis, which goes from 10 days to 12 weeks. During this period, the embryo is still sensitive, but we have major organs being formed. So the formation of the neural tube and the stem cells that eventually become mature neurons are being um, migrating throughout and forming the brain. That is probably a major concern for us, right? So if there is radiation exposure during this period, the most common result of that, like I said, is intellectual disabilities an increase in intellectual disabilities. The other thing would be the development of solid tumors, like pediatric cancer. Once we get to the, uh, the fetus, it is, a, like, I, again, I said, the, a fairly mature, self-sustaining system, um, and this child is going to be more radio-resistant at this point than those earlier periods, Okay. So where this relates directly to clinical practice is if you work as a CT scanner, you're going to be asking a lot of folks, when was your last menstrual period? We want to be doing the CT scan within 9 to 10 days, within roughly 2 weeks of that last known menstrual period. Why? Again, if there's a dose to an unborn child at that point, it's do or die. It's not increasing the risk for... Um, intellectual disabilities or pediatric cancer. Okay? So we're saying that these genetic or hereditary effects are of more concern to us. Um, these are biologic effects on ionizing radiation on future generations. And I have news for you. I'm, the, uh, radiation has been here since the dawn of life on this planet. It is a key part of how organisms evolved and grew on this planet. And so it is part of our history as a species is that we learned how to adapt and even possibly developed adaptations related to radiation exposure. Um, nothing that we've seen in any of the data in terms of genetic mutation, suggests that people become Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? All of the genetic mutations that we've seen are normally occurring mutations, right? They're normally occurring things that are at a point something percentage of the population has this um, rare disorder already. So we do not see people growing wings, 
right? We do not see, see people who are able to walk up walls or walk through walls like the X-Men. What we see are things that are naturally occurring genetic mutations. Um, <clears throat> how are these caused? Um, well, there's radiation-induced damage to the DNA molecule in either the sperm or the ova. And then that's passed on to the next generation. These map directly onto natural spontaneous mutations, um, and the result is genetic disorders and various diseases. Um, there's a lot of different mutagens that are responsible for genetic mutations, right? Radiation is just one in a long list, okay? So, when we're thinking about these genetic or hereditary effects of radiation exposure, um, there is, it is possible that cellular damage can be repaired by enzymes, right? Um, it may just incapacitate the mutated gene. It may say, we don't want this gene. And so the body has an ability to recognize when something has become mutated and either uh, execute programs uh, cell death or in other ways regulate that. Um, there are dominant and recessive point mutations and this is largely an epigenetic me mechanism and it's not completely understood right now. Um, the radiation induced uh, genetic effects in humans um, as I've already said are things like intellectual disabilities um, and pediatric cancers. final thing that we should touch on here is a doubling dose concept. And this is whenever there's a dose of radiation that can be mapped onto causing a increase of at least twice in the population some genetic effect. We will call that a dose doubling. Um, and so for example a certain percentage of offspring in every generation have for example Down syndrome. Let's say it's 7%. There's radiation exposures that will also cause the increase of incidence of Down syndrome up to 14%. We would then call that a dose doubling exposure. Um, the estimated radiation uh, dose doubling amount is 1.56 sieverts. 1.56 sieverts. You might want to remember that number. It is a little bit important but it's good just to know what this concept means. Okay, let's take a break.